Hallelujah. The presence of God is overwhelming here this morning. It's overwhelming. I almost wish that my sister would just continue and then we just pray and close the morning session. I was begging God to tell her to continue. I didn't feel like preaching. Before you started saying that you receive your songs on the altar, God said it to me that you know that what she's singing, I just gave it to her there. And I was saying to myself that I, I, I wish, I hope media is recording that song. I want, to, I want to go with that, this one, this one. This one she sang this morning. I want to, I want to go with it. When I listen to people sing, I don't listen to them with my ears. I listen to them with my spirit. Worship is not words. Worship is revelation. If you don't know how to access revelation, you will never know how to worship. If all you have are words, you will sing sweet songs, you will get emotional, but you won't touch God. The way we touch God in a worship meeting is by revelation. This is why the Bible says that the 20 and 4 elders, they consistently bow before God's throne. You know what keeps them in that activity? Because every time they look at God, they see something they didn't see before. And on the basis of that revelation, they bow again. They raise their heads, they see something they didn't see before, and it activates their worship. Have you noticed in scriptures that every time someone had an encounter with God, the Bible will say they fell down and worship. Because worship is a product of revelation. And you see, I'm afraid of my generation. I feel that we like sweet songs. We don't really like worship. We like a song that tickles our emotions. And like I tell them back where I'm coming from, I say, is this song for you? Is it for you? This song is not for you, it's for God. So why are you looking for a song that will excite you? True worship is like a ladder. When you are singing the words, because you are singing it from a portal of revelation, you'll be ascending to the places where God is. You know, I teach my people, the secret place is not your room. You know, I want to go to my secret place. The secret place where the Bible says that your father, who is in secret, he will reward you openly. The place that is called the secret is not your room. The place that is called your secret is not that your closet where you go and pray. The secret is the place in the spirit where God steps out of the shadows. Is no longer hidden. It's a place in the spirit. If you stay long enough with God, you will get to that place. The whole idea of entering into your room is to give you a sense of privacy. But the secret place is a portal, is a realm in the spirit. You will know when you get there. When you get there, God steps out of the shadows and says, here I am. He offers himself to you. The presence of God is so rich this morning. So I want you to... to to pour your love on him so, 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 so powerfully. In your own words now, just take two, three, four, five minutes and just let him know you love him. Let him know you love him. Let him know you love him. Wherever you are, just, just, my sister was saying that like the woman with the alabaster box, I come before you and I break it. Can you break yours? Can you put your heart into words? and eulogize God this morning. If God has ever been good to you, if he has ever shown you glimpses of his person, if, he, if you've ever heard his whispers, if you've ever looked upon the beauty of his face, if you've come into the environment of his light, open your mouth now and just pour your love on him. 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 If it is loud in your spirit, it will be loud in your mouth. Don't look for how to shout. Just look for that place. Travel there. When you get there and it becomes loud in your spirit, you will not know when you are shouting. You will not know when tears fall from your eyes. It's not something you fake. It's not something you, you build by your emotions. It's a place in the spirit. And I want us to get there. When my brother was leading prayers, he said that Moses came to the mountain of the Lord. 
There is a place in the spirit that is called the mountain of God. If we get there, God will step out of the shadows. He will say, my love, here I am, here I am, here I am. And if ever God decides to show himself, a man that sees him can never be the same. Can never be the same. No matter how many preachers you meet, if you don't meet God, your life will never change. Your story will never change. When you meet a preacher that can show you God and you meet God, that is when transformation takes place. Open your heart, open your mouth and just worship him. I sense him so strong in this place. I feel like Isaiah, that the day that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. I saw him high and lifted up. The train of his garment filled the temple. Somebody see him, see him, see him, see him. Pour your love on him this morning. Let him know how much you love him. I know there might be pain in your body. The same God who saved you can heal you. The pain might still be there, but look beyond the pain and just call him Abba, Abba. Call him Abba. Let him know how much he means to you. Let him know how much he means to you this morning. Elevara kope mani kabula sa andi le cruz na kaliata le brasada bakada. Let the banks of your heart overflow with love this morning. Let it overflow with love this morning. You can do it in whatever language you are comfortable. But make sure you do not close your mouth. And just in case I am wasting your time, you can sit down. This moment is for lovers. This moment is for those who have weighed it all and seen that if I have nothing and I have Jesus, Jesus is more than enough. If I have nothing and all I have is Jesus, Jesus is more than enough. Some of you as you are worshipping, you will begin to hear sounds of instruments. Some of you will be hearing songs. Don't close your mouth. Open your mouth and sing it. It's a ladder. It's a ladder. We are ascending to the mountain of God. And when we get there, the Bible says on the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. Whatever you came seeking this morning, God will give you on the mountain of the Lord. He will give you on the mountain of the Lord. He will give you on the mountain of the Lord. Open your mouth and, and just love on him. Sister, just love on him. Sister, just love on him. Brother, just love on him. I know there are many unanswered prayers. I know your life is not yet where it's supposed to be. But it does not matter. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And just give him worship. Give him worship. Jesus, give him worship. Give him worship. Give him worship. Oh, the one I love is ever before me. He seals upon my heart. I live for the one I love. The one I love is ever before me. He seals upon my heart. I live for the one I love. Oh, the one I love is ever before me. He seals upon my heart. 
Rasako Perikadi Lando La Pribanazis La Brasana Manako Belemani Akode Badi Adada I just saw a weight, a weight of depression lift. I don't know if the person is in this room or following us online. Battling with depression, I just saw it lift. I just saw it lift right now, right now, right now, right now, right now. You come out smiling, but in the secret places of your room, you are struggling with shame, with depression, with sorrow. Intense weight of sorrow comes over you. And you just find yourself weeping, weeping, weeping. You can't tell anybody what's wrong. But when you step out of the room, you are smiling at everybody. But I just saw that, that, that cloud lift. I just saw it 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 lift. That devil is a liar. Nothing will steal your joy. I don't know the woman I'm speaking to now. Nothing will steal your joy. Nothing will steal your joy. Oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. The Lord is healing people's emotions right now. There are many of us that have been broken, hurt, offended. Oh my God. I see someone that has been battling with unforgiveness unforgiveness someone offended you you've not been able to let it go and God has been highlighting it as a matter I just saw the hand of the Lord stretch to that individual and that weight is being lifted right now being lifted being lifted this session right now God is healing our emotions he's healing our emotions he's healing our emotions he's healing our emotions he's healing our emotions I did not know that there were some that were broken amongst us. But I see Jehovah Rapha at work. I see him 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 at work. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Your joy is coming back. Oh, the joy of your salvation is coming back. I don't know who that person is. Your Christian life has become a struggle. You no longer enjoy the faith. But the joy of salvation is coming back. You are going to begin to love on God again. Enjoy your work with God like never before. Your work with God has become a religious routine. Nobody knows. You are just going through the motions. But that, that juice that used to be there, that, that sweetness, that joy, it had been lost. But I saw the Lord pouring it upon you. I saw him filling you like a vessel. What I saw is like an, another vessel filling another vessel. And he said, it's the joy of salvation. It's the joy of salvation. Oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence this morning. Thank you for what we know you will do by the instrument of your word. Take all the glory in the name of Jesus. Oh, la, ba, 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 ba. Mm. Sit down if you can. Just leave me. Oh, I, I just want to be where you are. Oh, dwelling daily in your presence. I don't want to worship from afar. Draw me near to where you are. I just want to be where you are. Dwelling daily in your presence. Holy Manakatusa. Worship from afar. Eli knows you. Draw me near to where you are. I want to be where you are. Dwelling in your presence. Feasting at your table. Surrounded by your glory. 
in your presence. That's where I always want to be. I just want to be with you. Oh, I want to be where you are. Well, you in your presence, feasting at your table, surrounded by your glory. That's where I always want to be. I just want to be. want to be with you. you. Oh, I want to be. I want to be where you are. Dwelling in your presence. Fisting at your table.
Hallelujah. Let's see what we can do in 40, 45 minutes and then we'll come back to give God praise. Hallelujah. So yesterday we attempted to understand the need for the refinery. Why did the refining process become necessary? Um, refining was not part of God's original plan or design, but it was factored into God's plans and purposes because of the corruption that had occurred on, on account of Adam's rebellion. So when Adam rebelled, the man became corrupted. And when you read the book of Romans, the Bible says that even creation was subject to what the Bible calls the bondage of corruption. The bondage of corruption. So that which God created and when he had was done creating, he said was good, a virus infiltrated that whole enterprise and man became corrupted. It's on the basis of this that salvation became necessary. So in salvation, you are delivered from that corruption and then you are restored to divine order. You are delivered from that corruption and then you are restored to divine order. This is what the Bible means when Paul was speaking and he said that the Spirit of God beareth witness with our spirits that we are sons of God. And on occasion of that testimony, we now have capacity to call God Father. Because when man sinned in the Garden of Eden, what happened to man is that Satan became the spiritual father of man. So you hear Jesus speaking to the Pharisees and he says, you are like your father, the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. So when I see you, when I see your character, when I see the um, signs that you portray, I can trace your genealogy. I know who your father is. So because Satan became the spiritual father of man, salvation is described in certain contexts. So Paul will tell us in Colossians that he has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and he has brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. So in salvation, fatherhood is restored. In salvation, government is changed. Fatherhood is restored, government is changed because everyone who is born into this realm, because Satan had become the spiritual father of man, invariably Satan also received authority to exact government over man. So anyone that is not born again is under Satan's jurisdiction, under Satan's control, under Satan's dominion. So what God does at salvation is that he delivers you from that control, from that government, and then he brings you under government. He restores you to divine order. So part of that restoration process is where the refining takes place. There are very theological phrases that are used for that. One of that is what we call sanctification. Sanctification is the process of refining because in sanctification, what happens to you theologically is that God is working on you to become more like him. That's the sanctification process. You are being set apart. You are no longer common. And then God is now working great work upon your heart, upon your life, upon your spirit so that you will look like Jesus. The criteria for entering heaven is not the name of your denomination. What is going to guarantee your place in the heavenly realms and in the heavenly courts? What is going to guarantee your throne when we will sit down with Christ to judge nations? What is going to guarantee your place on God's side? It's not the denomination you attended while you were on earth. It is the way you have been molded and shaped to look like Christ. The gate pass for heaven and the gate pass for the new Jerusalem is not titles that were given to you in the earth. The gate pass into the new Jerusalem, where you will take your throne. The Bible says that we will sit with Christ to judge nations. The gate pass is that every man's life will be put side by side with Christ. 
If you do not look like Christ, you are not qualified for that experience. So Paul will say things like, my little children of whom I travel as in bed until what? Christ be formed in you. So all those symbolisms that we were looking at yesterday, the whole idea of the refining process, because if you look at those symbolisms, you will see the various instruments for refining. Remember that in this conference and in this convention, our emphasis is on one instrument, and we've not gotten there yet. I hope I will get there in the night. I'm just trying to build. There's one instrument, although Pastor Blessing dealt with it in, a, 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 to a point on, on Friday. I'll just build from there. The instrument we are looking at in this conference is fire. But when you look at all the other refining processes, there is wind. Wind is what you use at the threshing floor. Crushing is what you use at the wine press or at the olive press. And this crushing can be with the feet or it can be with other instruments. But when you look at these things carefully, even the refining by fire, if you look at all these refining processes, you will see that the, the activities all point to the same end game. What is the goal of the refining process? Number one is separation. So for instance, when the grain is being threshed at the threshing floor, we want to separate the grain from the shaft. The grain from the shaft. Another thing that happens at the refining place is purification. There is separation, then there is purification. And the purification dimension does not happen at the wine press, it does not happen at the oil press, it does not happen at the threshing floor. The purification dimension is associated with the fire expression of refining. That's when purification takes place. Another dimension of the refining process is that the refining process is, is for revelation. Revelation. That means the true condition of an item or an individual will be hidden to the visible eye until it has been put through a refining process. So you don't know the best of yourself until you, the refiner has decided to sit on your life. The best of what you can be, your possibilities in God, are all trapped in your willingness to go through the refining process. And this is the reason why many people are in church and they are wasting. They're just sitting down, unwilling to go far with God, unwilling to discover their possibilities in God, because they are not willing to go through the process where what it is that they have will now be refined so that it can be a blessing. If he doesn't go through the purification process, God will not allow it to be revealed. Because if it is revealed the way it is, it will contaminate men. So there is separation. And these things I'm explaining to you, I'm using it to explain the Christian life. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying to you. Please stay with me. The first one I said is what? The second one is what? The third one is what? The fourth one is perfection. That's what happens when you go through the refinery. There is separation. There is purification. There is revelation. And then there is perfection. So for you to be qualified for purification, you must first of all come out from amongst them and be what? Separate. Okay, let's establish that in scriptures. Micah chapter 3 and verse 2. Micah chapter 3 and verse 2. My brother that is helping us, I would like to, if you can help me so I don't have to keep going back to my tablet, if you can. Micah chapter 3, okay, let's use here then. Micah chapter 3 and verse 2. Let's see. Micah. What I want you to see in this verse 
is how the Lord introduces himself as a refiner. Hear this. Is it chapter 3 I'm looking for? Yes. Was it not Micah? Malachi, sorry. Malachi. I said Micah. Mm -hmm. Malachi, chapter 3 and verse 2. Sorry, I said Micah. Sorry. Malachi, chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. But who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a launderer's soap. Verse 3 is my emphasis. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify who? The sons of Levi. Not the entire Israel. Are you with me? Because if you look at the way God dealt with Israel, his dealings with Israel are symbolic of the way he deals with humanity. First of all, he called Israel and made him a firstborn among all nations. Even with Israel, he now had to select a specific group of people to become his choice people to do business with him. Out of all the 12 tribes of Israel, he selected Levi. When they were sharing inheritances to everybody, he said, Levi will not have any inheritance because I am their inheritance. My, 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 my best is what I give to Levi. I'm not going to give Levi lands. I'm not going to give them money. I'm not going to give them cattle. I'm not going to give them anything. I'm going to give them myself. And you see, what Satan has done in modern day Christianity is he has reduced the average believer to a member of all the other tribes. The average Christian's primary pursuit in life is how to be comfortable in this realm. So a Christian can go on in life and even if their, their relationship with God is not working, they are not, they are not troubled. If I can still attend church, if I can still speak the Christianese, if I can still look like a Christian and act like everything is well, the average Christian is not trouble. Prayer life can die. Love for God can die. Relationship with God can die. As long as we have the form, we are comfortable. And as long as with that form, the world looks at us and it seems like nothing is missing. With that form, we drive a good car. With that form, our children attend good schools. With that form, we have money. With that form, we can eat. So it now looks as if there is nothing missing, there is nothing broken, everything seems to be going according to plan. Meanwhile, the greatest inheritance for the believer is not a house or a car. Your greatest inheritance is all of God. What salvation made possible for you is not a breakthrough in business. Breakthrough in businesses are good. There's nothing wrong with breaking through. But if that is all your Christian life can produce, your Christian life is beggarly. The greatest blessing a believer has is all of God. That's what God was using the tribe of Levi to model. He said, I will be your inheritance. I, had, I hear preachers now say that uh, um, 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 if, you, if, if all you have is prayer, and you don't have money, you cannot fulfill your destiny. Now, as beautiful as it sounds, and when they say these things, young people in the congregation will shout, hey, go deeper. If, you, if all you have is prayer and you don't have money, you cannot fulfill your destiny. And people say, Kai, deep. The reason you think it is deep is because you don't know what prayer is. You don't know what prayer is. Just go and study the life of Elijah. A man, a man that could raise the dead. A man that could make a barrel of wheat, a busy corn now, not to dry up. Hmm. A man who shut up the heavens for three and a half years. When he was shutting it up, he said, there will not be rain, there will not be sunshine, there will be nothing, and 
except at my word. He didn't say except Jesus speaks. He didn't say except I go and pray and ask God. He said my word. I, God is not even involved in the equation. I'm in charge. Then you think that that man, if he needed a blessing, he would be disabled or incapacitated. It's because we don't know what prayer is. If you know what prayer is, you will find out that a praying man can never be at a disadvantage. A praying man. Never. He won't be blind. He won't be deaf. He won't be confused. He won't be crippled in life. Because when you begin to pray consistently, you'll be making contact with the realm of God. And the more you make contact with the realm of God, the more God is magnified in your eyes. And if there's ever anything you don't have, you will realize that it's not because God cannot give you. You've met God. You've touched him. You know that he has it within himself to give you anything. If he doesn't give you, it's not because he cannot. It might be that you are in a season of your life that you cannot yet handle the blessing. Because God will never give you a blessing that your character cannot handle. He's more concerned about shaping and building you so that when he puts the blessing upon you, you will not collapse under the weight of it. You know how many men God has trusted with the blessing, whether it's spiritual, whether it is material, and because the gifts of God are irrevocable, they have gone on to grow in that blessing and in that gift, and they have used the gift to abuse the body. So they are still in the pulpit. They are still doing ministry. But God has departed long ago. And you know the thing about that thing is when you, when you plug iron to iron a shirt, if NEPA or PACN or BEDC takes the light in between, the iron will still be hot. It is after a while that people will now find out. Say, ooh, this is not the iron shirt again. So there are many that are still jumping around and doing everything. And meanwhile... The Lord has departed. So your prize on the, on the path of spiritual progress, money is good. This conference costs money. We need money to do ministry. I got an SOS Macedonian call from Uganda. Sir, we've been following you. Come to us, please. Come to us. We are begging, come to us. So I went to meet a missionary organization. I said, I know you people used to travel. How, how, how much do I need? Barest minimum to enter into Uganda and go to so, 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 so villages. They did calculation. Five million. That is minimum comfort. Oh. We will trek some places like this. For two hours, we will trek. Minimum comfort. Money is good. But you see, if all you have is money and you don't know God, your life is a waste. So with Levi, God was trying to model to us that the journey of the Christian faith, you, you, you only celebrate it as a success if you can apprehend God. God is the prize of the believer. That's why where we read yesterday, Paul was saying that, I know whom I have believed. I know him. What I know about him is not just what I heard from the mouth of a preacher. I met him. I contacted him. I know him. Look at what the Bible says. It says, my sheep know my voice. My sheep hear my voice. The voice of a stranger, they will not follow. So the prize for the Christian is all of God. And you see me, I have made up my mind that before I die, I will find God. Me, I will find him. I've read too many books and listened to too many men speak about God in a certain way. I want to talk about God the way men like Tuza spoke about him. I read Tuza's book and I was damaged for weeks. What kind, how does a man speak about God as if God is in his backyard? Tozer has died since the 1960s. You pick up his book today, it's like it's a fresh manual. A man met God. A man met God. And you see, if your life becomes that kind of life, you will die before men 
But what God did with your life will be a ladder for generations. For, for generations. You met God. So when we come to conferences like this, part of what we try to do is to reorder our thinking. That the Christian, our pursuit is not glory in this world. Our pursuit is to become so aligned with God that the riches of his grace can find expression through our lives. So it's on the basis of that that God was now speaking in Malachi when he now says that I will sit upon the house of Levi. This is a family matter. This matter is not for everybody in the crowd. This matter is for intimates. It is for the people I have drawn close. I have separated them from all the other tribes. And since they are separated, when they do certain things, I will not take it the way I take it from other tribes. Hmm. The more proximus you become to God, the more dangerous it is. You know what I mean by that? The closer to God you become, the closer to God you become, the more dangerous it is. There are things that God will take from other people. You try it. You try it. You'll be shocked. You'll be shocked. So he said, now that I have separated you from other tribes, I will sit upon you. And in Revelation, what God is going to do is that your, your, the version of you that will bring most profit to the kingdom is that version of you that he now wants to announce to the world. When you look around church, many people are still only separated. And in fact, their separation is not complete. You know, when you read the book of 1 Kings chapter 18, and you see what was happening at Mount Carmel, what was causing all the fight at Mount Carmel? What was the matter at Mount Carmel? Have you ever wondered? It was a matter of worship. The matter at Mount Carmel was a matter of worship. And when we are saying worship here, we're not talking about what we do when we are singing. You can use a song to worship God, but singing is not necessarily worship. Worship is the way you conduct your life on a daily basis. Worship is living. So when you wake up in the morning, you are already worshiping. How you relate with people in the office is part of worship. How you order your family as a man, the head of the house, how you order your family is part of worship. How you do the handle the things of God is part of worship. Worship is living. And in living, you can sing to worship. You can lie down to worship. There are all kinds of methods to worship. But the most, the priority of worship is your life. Is the way you live. So the matter at Mount Carmel was a matter of living. Israel had become a people of divided loyalties. And if you've ever read the scriptures by yourself carefully, you will find out that God does not joke with loyalty. He wants you for himself. He doesn't want to share you. Oh, have you not read the scripture? I, your God, am a jealous God. He doesn't want to share you with it. If the matter for God is total and absolute loyalty. This is why one of the metaphors he uses to describe his relationship with the Christian is the metaphor of husband. Have you seen that metaphor in the Bible? He uses the metaphor of husband. He will call Israel, I am your husband, you are my wife. Indicative of the fact that one man, one wife, you cannot, you cannot go and meet another man as long as you are betrothed and married to me. Loyalty must be absolute. But what happened in the book of Kings that necessitated God calling Elijah from where he had been making him was that their loyalties had become divided. It's not that some people were serving Baal and Ashtaroth and some people were serving God. That's not what happened there. All of the Israelites, they were both serving Baal and Ashtaroth and God at the same time. That's what was happening. This is why when they now came to Mount Carmel, Elijah said, let's settle the matter once and for all. You cannot keep halting between two opinions. Because what they were doing is, they would go to Baal. 
when they, 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 they are tired, they will come to God. When they are tired, they will go to Ashtaroth. They were running between two opinions. The matter there was a matter of loyalty and of worship. So there are people who are in the body of Christ who attend church. Their separation is not even complete. They are doing combined service. They come to God, they come to meetings like this where we are on fire and we talk about revival, but every strange prophet on Facebook ministers to their soul. If at this time you need a preacher to stand in the pulpit to tell you, this one does not know God, this one is fake, I wonder the Jesus you met. One of the things that Jesus does to your spirit is that he sharpens your spirit. A true believer will have at the base level discernment of, of spirits. At the base. There is a gift of discernment of spirits, but at the base level, you should be able to discern that this fountain is not of God. I was speaking to one of my daughters who is in the United States last night, and then she was saying to me that she entered into a church, and then the prophet they invited to the church that as the man was ministering, she could sense that this one, this one is not from God. Then when he ministered to a level, he came to her and said, I need to tell you something privately. <laughs> Ooh. And then took her. I wanted to now begin to lay hands on her. and You know what I mean by lay hands on her? Not, not, not for anointing sake. At the base level, if you are making contact with home country, your prayer life is working, you will have discernment. But now everybody is your man of God. So you attend a meeting like this where you are revived. Then when there is small shaking, you look for the one that can see. And you don't know what he's using to see. When will you start seeing for yourself? There's something in the Bible called seeing eyes, hearing ears, and a heart that understands. Is it is the characteristic of a true believer, seeing eyes. You are seeing beyond your natural eyes. You can see into the realm of God. At a base, you should be able to see for yourself. You should know things about your life. What a prophet of God should do for you is that he should confirm the things God has told you in secret. When he speaks, he should bear witness with God's dealings in your heart. But some are not totally separated. Doing combined service, if they are not religiously prostituting themselves back and forth, some of them have refused to remove their hand from sin. And because God is such a God of mercy, you know that, bro, I assure you. Eh? Are you following me, sir? I assure you that if you enter one corner now with one sister in this event center and fornicate, when you get up, you'll still be able to do labor, lama, covina, tupa. In fact, it will be sharper. It won't stop. In fact, when you finish, if we give you mic, this place can. Woo! So because God is merciful, people touch sin and they see that it does not alter them in any way. So they are encouraged to continue. They have refused to be totally separate unto God. So even though the Bible says you have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of the, of the dear son, they still have a hand that connects them to Satan. Satan still pulls them like a puppet master. So Satan can wake them up in the night and say, masturbate. And they will yield willingly to masturbation. Because Satan will be whispering in, their, whispering in their ear that, if you don't masturbate, you will die. You will die. This erection will kill you. Can't you see the erection has come? Ah, you are hungry for sex. You are hungry for sex. You are hungry for sex. Then they feel that they will die. My question I have always asked young men is, I have been around a while. I have never seen an obituary poster where they say, gone too soon. And they now say, why did he die? They say, he didn't masturbate. He died. 
that the sexual urge was so much upon him, he didn't satisfy it. So he what? He died. It has never happened. Never happened. But Satan understands that what sin is, is a weapon of government. That's what sin is. It's a means of control. He knows that the more you gratify your, your, your carnal lust, the more you empower it to control you. So gratification is an application for slavery. So every time there's, there's you, you, you know that anger is in your bosom. Every time Satan tempts you to, to rage, he knows that it will be more difficult the next time to, for self-control. Every time you yield to rage, say, Naso Abin, Naso Abin, Naso, oh God, Naso you be. It's because you were separated, but you are not fully separated. If you were separated, at separation, the old man dies. The old man, he dies. So if you say, now so you be, what happened to you at separation? You carried your old self there. So it's on the basis of this that God recognizes that for some of us, as the separation occurs, there are areas of our life where the flesh has gained such mastery that it will require both your partnership with God to see that that mastery is conquered once and for all. So he brings you and he puts you in the refinery. That refinery is now purification. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's both instant and then it is lifelong for as long as you are on the earth. God will keep purifying, keep removing. Because at that point, what God is dealing with, he's dealing with the impurities and he's separating the things that are of no value so that only that which has value will, will be remaining. And when he gets to that point, he can now present the man. He can reveal him to the world to see. Purification. And then by the time you begin to read scriptures, you will now see how purification occurs. There is something called the furnace of affliction. <laughs> the furnace of affliction. God can use affliction. Okay, let's look at two scriptures. Two. Let me see if I can find two. Are you getting blessed? Give me Isaiah 48 and verse 10. Okay, we're not there yet. Isaiah 48 and verse 10. For those of you who are writing, let's read Isaiah 48 and verse 10. We'll build gradually. Isaiah 48 and verse 10. Psalms and Proverbs, Isaiah. Behold! I have refined you, but not as what? Silver. I have tested you where? In the furnace of affliction. Now, this is not just purification. This is what you call testing, proving. These two things happen at the purification point. Like I said, God is removing impurities, and then he's separating the things that are of no value and leaving only the things that are of value because that is the man he wants to reveal to the world. So God has removed the impurities, but now he now needs to check, will this product function according to design? You know, those of you that have done engineering, done manufacturing, done all of that, when they manufacture a car, for instance, in the lab, they will run it at certain speeds to see how that car will survive in a crash. How that car will perform. So when God wants to test performance, once he wants to test if this thing will operate according to specification, he turns on the heat in the refinery. That dimension of heat is called the furnace of affliction. So you will go through certain seasons in your life where you will be praying over a matter for 10 years. It will look like God is deaf. 
in your presence like this, the same thing you are seeking for 10 years, it will be given to people cheaply in your presence. He's waiting to see whether your trust in him has become absolute. Your confidence in him unwavering. Your eyes fixed on him. The children of Israel have not left Egypt for how many years? They already began to murmur. He just turned on the heat and allowed them to suffer lack one or two things. They began to say, I beg, take us back to Egypt. Do you know that this is why as God put up with them, put up with them, he got to a point to say, enough. No man that came out of Egypt entered Canaan. I want that to sink in your heart. No man. No woman. No child. Everybody that was there on that day, Exodus 12 and 13, that walked out of Egypt with their own two legs, none of them entered Canaan. You know when, when clowns are talking in the pulpit and say you can't lose your salvation, they don't understand the symbolisms and typologies of the Bible. Egypt is known as the place of affliction. It's the place of slavery. It's a spirit city. It represents where everybody is born into. That's where Egypt is. Canaan is the land of promise. It's a representative of the spirit city that is called Zion. That's where all of us are going. God brought all of them out. But those that came out did not enter Canaan. Even the one that brought them out did not enter. The one that brought them out. His own case was different. Though. All of them that came out, they died. He said, no, you can't, you can't enter like this. You cannot enter like this. He said, only those that were born in the wilderness, they were born in the seasons of affliction, only that generation will enter. Everybody who came out with their own leg, they died in the wilderness. They died. God, part of God's refining process is that if you are a true son and daughter of the Most High, you will go through seasons of affliction. It's a furnace. The goal is not to kill you. The goal is to prepare you for revelation. It's not to kill you. This is why the Bible says he will not put on you more than what you can bear. He will not. They say there is no temptation that has overtaken any man that is not common to all men. He said, but with every temptation, what will God do? Make a way of escape. The furnace of affliction. It's a dimension of the purifying phase because God wants to reveal you so that you can stand like Jesus stood and said, the prince of this world cometh, and he has nothing in me. There is nothing in my hand that belongs to Satan. And there is nothing I want that Satan can give. Nothing. He has nothing in me. Look at Job now. Job's problem, my sister, Job's problem was because God was proud of him. Hmm. Preach to your neighbors. Say, be well. If God is proud of you, a furnace is coming. Hmm. God was proud of him. Proud. Go and read now. Read Job chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. Satan is not the one that came to say, Baba, Baba J, I see one guy. No. Satan had not even spoken. Satan was just giving a report of his activities. He said, I've been, where, where are you coming from? He said, I've been going to and fro in the earth. He said, walk about. You do like waka. Eh? Just a waka everywhere. Okay, since you waka about like this, did you see my servant Job walk about? If, if indeed you've been walking about, you must have seen Job. Say, yes, oh, yes, oh, I saw Job. Say, Kai, have you considered that there is none like him on the face of the... What kind of implication is this? What, what, kind, what kind of trouble is this? That there is none like him on the face of the earth. Sit and say, I know now. He say, is it not because you have built a hedge around him? Say, eh, I want to prove to you that men can love me for nothing. I know Job's heart. 
I have interfaced with Job. Job was a man of the altar. A man who knew how to go to the altar. The Bible says that his children will do party and marry. He will wake up in the morning and carry a bull for a sacrifice. While they are sleeping, he will go to the altar and say, Lord, have mercy. I said I will teach you how to repair altars. One of the technology for repairing the altar is called repentance. When, when Isaiah took 12 stones, 12 stones symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel, and he used it to rebuild the altar, he was saying, Lord, we have sinned. Have mercy. I and my father's house. Repentance. Job carried, he carried the, the, the sacrifice. He will go there and the Bible says he will stand before the Lord and plead on behalf of his children. He said, Lord, I don't know. I was not there. It's possible as they were celebrating, they sinned against you. Have mercy. God knew Job's heart. He knew Job's heart. So he said, I know Job. Job is not running after me. You know, we can sing all kinds of songs in church. I'll be chasing after you, chasing after you, and we'll be doing like this. <laughs> Meanwhile, God is looking from heaven and saying, you, you, ah, you've not finished chasing money, it's me. No. He said, I will prove to you, I want to use a full grown man's life as an experiment to show you that Job loves me for nothing. He's obsessed with me. I am the center of attraction in the matter. It's not the things I have given him. Satan said, does Job love you for nothing? He said, I will prove to you. Take everything he has. He said, but don't touch his life. Do you know that this is why Baal could not call down fire at the altar of Mount Carmel? Because every power Satan has is delegated. The Bible says that Jesus is the head of all principalities and powers. So Satan, you know you, you are not afraid of God. My brother, these Christians, they are not afraid of God, but Satan is afraid. This generation, we are not afraid of God. Though. That is saying that God, they fear them. <laughs> they, don't, they don't fear God. Somebody will finish fornicating. Eh? And he says, it's grace. He will climb the pulpit, hold Mike. Eh? Boldly! And say he's ministering on behalf of God. <laughs> Jesus <Jay Sovier. laughs> This we, we don't, but the one you are afraid of, you are afraid of Satan. No? That one is afraid of God. God said, touch his business. Even kill his children, but don't touch his life. Satan was afraid. He obeyed God to the letter. What is Satan afraid of? So when the prophets of Baal were cutting themselves and doing everything, God said, this is a matter of worship. If I allow you to draw fire, I will validate your existence. Say, this fire, it won't come today. Don't think that Baal could not have called fire. He could have. In the book of Revelations, the Bible says that one of the ways the Antichrist will deceive nations is that he will cause fire to fall from heaven. Satan could have. But when it comes to a matter of worship, it has become a matter of honor. And God will defend his name no matter the cost. No matter the cost. Satan was afraid. He touched his business. Touched his money. The first time I read the book of Job, I read it with tears. I said, Jesus, was this man immortal? He will get to breaking point, then he will cry out, though he slay me. What kind of man is this? Small pressure that you are under. God just turned the heat a little. 
You are already threatening to run away from the refinery. That's why you have not become anything in the hand of God. Small pressure. You are already at the place where you want to deny him. Sons must be tested. When they go through the furnace of affliction, there will be a stamp in the realm of the spirit. Tested and approved. When such a son steps into eternity, they know a son has come. Tested and approved. Many have not survived the crucibles, the furnace of affliction. Look at Job now. Job 23, give me 9 and 10. Job 23, 9 and 10. Job 23, 9 and 10, if you can find it. He says, I do not know the way that he takes. When I go to the right, I cannot find him. When I go to the left, I cannot find him. Go to the next verse, verse 10. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he had tried me, I will do what? Comfort as gold. He's saying that when I've gone through my purification, my day of revelation is at the corner. Many have not made it to the place where God can reveal them to a generation. It's not by praying 15 hours. We pray long. We pray hard. We pray loud. Have you been tested? Can you survive suffering? Can you see people having the very things you are asking from God and yet your faith in God will not diminish? Can you wait on God for three years over a matter See God blessing everybody in, around you and yet trust him that what you told me is not a lie. Can you wait? So God has to invoke the technology of the refinery so that he can begin to cure us of the things that are not valuable. That's the second technology for the rebuilding of the altar. It's called consecration. It's called consecration. This is where you go to God and say, this life is your own. Do with it as you will. If you want to damage me, damage me. Just like my sister was saying, I teach my people back home. Who told you that you need to be visible to be fulfilled? You can be unknown, unheard of, and yet be God's man. You can be at the backside of church. Nobody knows your name. And yet, be God's man. Yes, like Ananias. The only reason Ananias came out of the cave was because God had an assignment for him. If you want to ask me who is Paul's spiritual father, I will tell you he's Ananias. He's Paul's spiritual father. Let's imagine now that there's a crisis in Benin. What do you have with God that God can send you from where you are to go and start a major apostolic move? Do you know who Paul is? Wait first. God is not in a hurry. When he's making men, he's not in a hurry. Hmm? He could have told Paul to sit at the street called Street and send for Peter to come from Jerusalem. Peter would have arrived some days. Paul would have been there with his eyes closed praying. But God searched in the city. Like Ezekiel 22 and verse 30. He searched in the city. And he said, Kai, I have a man here. I have someone here. Someone that has been to the refinery. I can trust him with this assignment. I can trust him with this assignment. And he rooted him from the cave. And Ananias got there. Because of what God had told him in the secret, the nomenclature with which he addressed Paul changed. He said, Brother Paul. <laughs> That's the same man that he was arguing with God. He said, I know the man. Oh. He wants to kill all of us. He said, Is he not a vessel I have chosen? Immediately, Ananias heard that. He knew that this was a family matter. So when he got there, he said, brother Paul
You see, what God wants to do in this conference is that if you have not entered that season of the refinery, he said, I should come and tell you, it's coming. Nobody will escape it. Nobody. Go and study any great man of God. You will see seasons of affliction. Not to kill you, but to prepare you for revelation. So that you will come out. And if they, if they bless you with 20 million, you can take it and put it in the church project. Even if your children don't have food to eat. That God gives you anointing. You will not use that anointing to be touching young girls in church. You don't know what anointing is, bro. If there's anointing on your life, you automatically become attractive. Some ladies will think they are doing God an honor by giving you their body. That's why it is called abuse of position. You overpower them by the place that you hold. They, they are weak before you. Just today, one of my sons sent me a video on Facebook and I was just the love of God at work. They are giving people scholarship. He must be a man of God. Even Satan can give scholarship. The reason we are under pressure to prove philanthropy is because we are trying to cover up for something we don't have. Because before God and before men, God is not under pressure to prove to you that he can do something. He's not under pressure. When some of us talk, they say, is it only your clan that, is, that are men of God? Oh God, I have small discernment, small. I'm not, I'm not speaking to you like I'm a great man of God. I'm still growing with Jesus. I have small this. If I hear a man once, I know the fountain he's preaching from. Once. Once. These are people we are pointed at and say, this one, he doesn't know God. And people say, you are too critical. I'm trying to save a generation. Now it's obvious. It's in the open. And these are the ones that are bold enough to come out. There's some shame will not allow them talk. A young girl was crying in my office. Kata was falling from her nose. We slippers, dirty leg, POS operator, quietly somewhere. She came to my office in pain. I had never met her. Don't know how she got my number. I must see you now. The way she was talking, I said, this is a crisis. Okay, come to my office. She came with her POS, abandoned the umbrella where it was, and ran into my office. She sat down. She had not sat down for 30 seconds. Tears were falling from her eyes. She could not be more than 19. I said, calm down, calm down. What is the issue? She will go and clean church. She's in sanitation department. She will enter toilet to be washing toilet. Her reverend with a collar we enter, lock the door behind her and start pressing on her body. She can't shout. She can't cry. It just kept happening. Kept happening. Now she's feeling dirty. Feeling used. She lies down. She's wondering what kind of useless life is this? That I'm just, a man just using me. Using me. Put hands in her body. And I told her, that's not who a pastor is. He's a wizard. Look him in the eye and if he touches you again, find me. Go and stand in front of the church and announce. When they are doing praise and worship, go and take the microphone from choir. And say, there's a problem in this church. Oh, there's problem. This man, this man. Until we get there as the body of Christ. Mad men will not stop. But that's why he brought us to this conference. So that men like Ananias can begin to rise up in Uniben. Rise up in, 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 in campuses. Rise up at street corners. That when he looks in the city, he can say, I have a daughter there. You don't know how painful Ezekiel 22 verse 30 is. It's painful. It's painful to read. Painful. The great immortal said, I sought for a man and I found none.
I sought for a man and I found none. The great immortal, he was looking everywhere, door to door. And you know the painful thing about that story? Some people still went to church that day. Some priests still wore their priestly garments and were walking with pride and pomp in the city. Meanwhile, God looked at them and said, this one is not a man. But men were looking at them and said, oh, great man, priest, oh, priest. Meanwhile, in heaven, he has been written off. God looked at an entire city and said there was no man there. Yet men were walking about. Men were eating. Some people even did birthday. Some people celebrated 50 years of ministry. Meanwhile, the great one said, no man there. No man. There's something called the furnace of affliction. And you see, when he puts you in the furnace of affliction, my dear brother, what he's working on is a part of you called your heart. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Your heart. Because in the life of an individual, your heart is your altar. Your heart is your altar. That's where God wants to purify. That is where he wants to fix. That is what he wants to make to be a heart of flesh so that you become a portal through which he can express himself, your heart. Give us Proverbs 17 and verse 3. As I want to tie this up so we can pray. Proverbs 17 and verse 3. See, bro, God is not, is not wicked. Though. If God decides to put you through the furnace of affliction, it's because he wants the best for you, the best. Oh, I remember days that it was as if God, God just said, anything that has Kesena's name on it, put it in a fire. And we send prayer, send prayer, send prayer. It's like the angel on duty. When he sees my name, he says, K-I-V. Anything that had my name on it, it was as if God was not interested. But those were the days I learned how to stay with God. I will be begging God. No matter how much of you I taste, do not allow me to be satisfied. I'll be begging God. I'll be begging God. Let nothing in this world, God. It looked as if everybody had left me behind. My life was useless. Family members laughed. I am not yet where I want to be. But bro, my eyes are fixed on Jesus. <laughs> You see me, there is nothing in this world I want. Nothing, nothing. Oh, God knows me. If he appears here now and says I'm giving you a blank check, he knows what I will ask for. God knows. <laughs> God, he knows. That if he gives me a blank check, I don't need a house. I'm not hungry for car. He knows what Kesena will ask for. He knows the bodies, the things that bring tears to my eyes in the night. Two days ago, I was in prayer and I was begging him. I said, Lord, homosexuality wants to finish the body of Christ now. Lesbians are everywhere. Homosexuals everywhere. The church seems not to have answers. And I was begging him, will you not release an anointing that will bring deliverance? I was begging him. Proverbs 17 and and verse 3. I said, give me 17, Proverbs 17 and verse 3. I was waiting for you. Oh, nothing in this world can satisfy. <laughs> Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Nothing in this world, nothing in this world can satisfy. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, now look at it. He says, the finding pot is for what? And the furnace for gold. But the Lord do what? Do you know what the scripture means? That the finding pot, when it comes to an individual, hmm? if you are dealing with silver, what you put in the finding pot is silver. If you are dealing with gold, what you put in the furnace is gold. But when you are dealing with an individual, 
what you put in the finding pot is the man's heart. What you put in the furnace is the man's heart. So when God is taking you to the furnace, when he's taking you to the refining pot, what he's working on is your heart. Men look at the outward, but God looks where? At the heart. A man's work with God cannot be greater than the condition of his heart. If your heart is black, there are, there are only a few places God will allow you access. Go and read Matthew chapter 15. The Bible says that they came to start talking to God about trivial things. He said, look, it's not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles him. He says, when he goes in, it will come out to the buttocks. He said, but out of the heart proceeded evil thoughts, blasphemies, adultery. It's the heart that is the seat of immorality, the heart. You see, this is the message of God for us this morning. Who sits as government over your heart? I've taught my people, when we speak about the heart, it's not this thing beating in your chest, even though we use here to symbolize it. It's not this thing beating in your chest. The heart, theologically, is what we call the soul of man. Soul. That's the seat of your emotions, the seat of your will, your thoughts. That's who the man is. What he is in his soul is who he is in his life. In his emotions, in his thoughts, in his will. No wonder David said, search me <laughs> and see if there be any evil way. If God gets your heart right, that your heart, the Holy Ghost sits as government over your heart, I assure you, bro, there's nothing God cannot give you. Nothing. I wish, I wish we could just stay on this, on this teaching for the next one hour, but we have evening session. I want you to go to God this morning. And in case you are going through a tough season of your life, and you have been murmuring and complaining, repent and say, Lord, I didn't know you were working a good work. Fire is not comfortable. Oh. <laughs> if fire burn you in real life, in fact, in hospital, they have degrees of bonds. They have first degree, second degree, third degree. Don't joke with fire. Huh. Fire is not your mate. It's the same thing with spiritual fire. Depending on what God wants to do to your life will determine the degree of the furnace. All of us will not enter the furnace at the same degree. For some people, it will be heated seven times because it's taking you to nations. Many have gone to nations and died. They died. You know, right now, the reason, the thing driving your prayer life is that there's no light. Eh? And it's food. When you get to where everything is working, what will, what will you pray about? What will you pray about? Everything is working. At least if you work, you get money. As you have money, you can eat. What is what's the need for prayer? That's why many have traveled abroad, abroad and they have died spiritually. I know marriages that have died. Husband and wife are living there. Two of them, tongue-talking Christians. One has packed out. We are trying to resolve. What did happen? Say, uh, I don't understand. Oh, Oga, you that used to cast out devils, how did Satan reach your marriage? How? God packaged you as a missionary and sent you there as his man. Only one year, Satan has gained government over your soul. Who sits over your heart? Young people, who sits over your heart? Is it God that you want? Is it God that you want? I know that seasons can be painful. 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 Sometimes you can't explain to people. They look at you and say, but you deserve God now. And you don't have answers. <laughs> Just wait it out. If you don't have your reward on in this life, I assure you, 
On the other side, all the pain will be worth it. I assure you. When we appear at the other side, you'll be glad that you went to the furnace. Oh, face to face. Face to face. Till I see you face to face. Face to face. Face to face.